So where we're going to go today is we're going to talk about um, the relationship of the thorax with respect to low back and pelvic girdle pain. But before we get into that, there's a couple of considerations that I want to note. First of all, that when we look at impaired body regions, they are unique to the individual, which means basically that you could have impaired function in the pelvis and impaired function in the thorax, and they may not present with exactly the same functional impairments nor the exactly the same symptoms. So just because we have impaired, what we think to be impaired body regions doesn't necessarily mean that they are relevant to what the person is presenting with you today. Secondly, what we are starting to see more recently in physical therapy is the specialization of treatment for specific body regions. Because there's so much evidence to stay on top of, people are becoming specialized in, for example, knee disorders or low back pain or headache. And thinking that they can ignore the rest of the body and only just treat the one body region. And uh, what I'm hoping to sit, share with you and show with you today, that that may not be the, the best approach for, for helping people get better or to reach their goals, because each body region is an integrated, interdependent part of the whole body. Which leads me to the final consideration, and that's two things we need to consider before we tuck into the thorax and the pelvis. And that is this model, the regional interdependent model. Where did it come from? What's it about? And, and why is it starting to gain uh, traction in our industry? And the second is the um, topic of motor control and pain, because both will have a lot of relevance with respect to why I really feel that we need to take a step back not just look at the area of symptoms, not just look at um, the area of lack of function in one area and direct all our treatment to, to that area. So this title or this um, yeah, topic or title, I guess, Regional Interdependence Model, is a term that was coined in 2007 by Suweki, Cleland and Weiner. And there's been a few articles that have been published since that time on this model. And simply put, what this, this model proposes is that seemingly unrelated impairments in different parts of the body may in fact be contributing to and associated with the meaningful complaint or that patient's primary report of symptoms. And this concept that the primary symptom may be directly or indirectly related by various impairments is um, regardless of how close those impairments are to the primary symptoms. So I think most of us would say if someone came in with an insidious onset of knee pain, that it makes sense to look at function of the foot and the hip. But what we're talking about here is the function of the neck in relationship to the foot, the function of the foot in relationship to the cranial vertebral region, that the two regions that are playing off one another can truly be very far apart. So regions don't have to be adjacent and the response to the cumulative impairments can be quite widespread. Now, this concept is not new and it's not novel. We find evidence of this regional interdependence in the older osteopathic literature of over 120 years ago. And it certainly has been a concept that was embraced by the Canadian Orthopedic Division since the uh, onset of our quadrant of courses in the early 1980s by Earl Petman and Cliff Fowler. And back at that time, um, Cliff and, and Earl were also talking about this syndrome called the back knee syndrome, the relationship of impairments in the back, particularly around L3-4, contributing to patellar knee pain. So it's a concept that, that we have been interested in in Canada for a long, long time. But now it's becoming formalized and studied, which is a good thing. But the problem with most studies is that they appear to look backwards. They appear to be retrospective. In other words, Let's just manipulate the thorax and see what happens to range of motion of the neck. Let's manipulate the thorax and see whether or not the person can elevate their arm. With no um, understanding or no testing on predictability, is there anything that we can do before we do a treatment intervention that suggests that treating this area of the body is going to have a positive impact somewhere else? And this is an approach I would really like to share with you in this webinar, is how we are getting closer to being able to have specific tests that are going to help us um, identify when there are multiple impairments and persistent pain, where should we begin treatment? 
All right, so turning to motor control and pain and the impact of pain on motor control or altered motor control and pain, this has been a topic of much interest in, uh, in the research field probably since the mid-90s. So let's take a look at some key aspects of this topic and, and we're going to relate it back to the thorax and the pelvis as we move into the webinar. So what do we mean when we say motor control? Well, motor control is the, under the umbrella of motor control is all the sensory and motor elements that are related to motor actions that include everything about posture and movement. Um, it's often a term that, that is used in different ways by both clinicians and researchers, but I think if we come back to this definition, motor control speaks to everything that is about static postures or posture in a movement or even how we move. And what we know from the evidence is that the strategy, in other words, the pattern of muscles, which muscles the individual uses to perform that task is highly specific, not only to the task, but also to the individual, which means that we can't have an assumption that every time someone squats or every time they bend over, that there's a certain pattern of muscles that should be used. We know that motor control is influenced by everything things that the patient or the individual thinks, what their beliefs are, what they've experienced in the past, what they believe they've experienced in the past, uh, presence or absence of pain, even the threat of pain can, we know, can influence the strategy the individual uses for that specific task. So the specific patterns of, of muscles the individual uses for that task is unique to the individual, but not only that, within the individual, as I've mentioned previously, they're unique to the movement or posture, which means that we can't, we can't have generic assessment forms and saying that if the individual comes in with pelvic girdle pain or low back pain, that we're always gonna look at forward bending, that we're always gonna look at backward bending. We need to look at the task that is meaningful to the individual and reveals the non-optimal strategy that is problematic for that individual. So the evidence also shows that there isn't one strategy of muscle activation that's universally ideal, and there's not one strategy that is universally adopted by all patients in pain. So we know that back pain patients present with different patterns, so a redistribution of activity, not only between muscles, but within one muscle. So what that means is you can have one fascicle of iliocostalis or one fascicle of the external oblique that either is being recruited too much or too little for that task. So it's not an all or none phenomenon with patients. So we don't have either an inhibition or excitation of muscles um, in totality. And we don't find an inhibition or excitation in a stereotypical manner. And I think this is really important to acknowledge. This is where the evidence is now. All the muscles of the trunk contribute to movement and control. And if our goal in rehab is to modify the motor control strategy um, in order to distribute loads more effectively, what all this evidence supports is that we have to consider this on an individual basis with respect to what is needed by that individual patient. And this is the problem now with RCTs that attempt to identify a, an approach to low back pain, for example. There isn't going to be a treatment intervention or a certain exercise program that's going to fit everyone. We're back to the N equals one. We're back to looking at the individual patient and having ways to be able to identify what's right for them. Additionally, it, we cannot correlate pain to any particular strategy. There is no study to date that's demonstrated a direct relationship between any pathology and pain for any pain-related condition. So just because you have back pain doesn't mean you're gonna have the same recruitment strategy. Just because you have the same recruitment strategy as, as somebody next door doesn't mean you're gonna have pain. So neither the presence or absence of pain nor its intens intensity can be predicted by the presence or absence of pathology. So you may be sitting there thinking, wow, how do I know then when to treat what? And this is where we're starting to see on social media, lots of people saying, it doesn't matter if your thorax is twisted. It doesn't matter if you have poor control in your pelvis. I saw someone with poor control in their pelvis that ran a marathon. I saw somebody with multiple postural alignment problems in their thorax, and they are able to rappel down a mountain 
and then you see somebody who has one problem and they can't do anything because the impairment and the pathology does not necessarily relate to the amount of pain that they have. So where does that leave us at practitioners in terms of knowing what to do when? So this is a quote from uh, Mark Jones and Darren Rivett's new clinical reasoning book. It says that because research supported management efficacy is still lacking for most of the clinical problems, particularly people who have multiple problems. We're not talking about the, the first time you sprain your back or the very first whiplash you have. We're talking about the person who had a severe ankle sprain in their teenage years and then a lifting injury later, later on that left them with uh, problems in their back. Then they delivered two kids in their 20s and their early 30s with compromise to their pelvic floor and their abdominal wall. And then they got into a rear end collision when they're taking the kids to hockey, got concussed, and now they have a concussion, a whiplash, a sore back, poor pelvic control, urinary leakage, and a wonky foot. This is our clinical reality, right? This is the person who is coming in and is telling us the story that is perhaps only meaningful uh, what is meaningful to them right now? We often don't get the whole story. So how do we treat these people that would be absolutely excluded from every RCT that anyone tried to plan because they're just way too complicated? And so the recommendation, of course, is skilled clinical reasoning of the individual is our, is our best tool. So the, both our experience and the evidence suggests that an individualized assessment and treatment are required for best outcomes. But how do we do that? How do we individualize assessment? How do we know which impairment is the priority impairment to treat? How do we know that for Mrs. X, we should be treating her pelvis and, and Mr. Y, we should be going to the thorax when they're presenting with very similar pain patterns? How do we know? So what I'm gonna look at today is to, first of all, consider what are the requirements for a functional low back and pelvis? And at this stage, we can only be evidence-informed and not evidence-based. We don't have all the, all the evidence that we need for every patient. And then to propose some plausible mechanisms for how a suboptimal thorax function, having areas in your thorax that are either not moving well or are not well controlled under load, can contribute to loss of function of the low back and pelvis with or without pain because we have to separate the presence or absence of pain from our assessment of presence or absence of function. They do not correlate. So if we look first of all at the pelvis and what its function is, and a lot of this work, original work was done by Professor Andre Fleming back in the early 90s, we know that the pelvis functions like a platform to which attaches three levers. So this is a quote from um, Dr. Fleming. And if that platform is not stable, in other words, if the joints can't be well controlled, then not much else works well in the body. So we need to have optimal control in the pelvis and a small amount of, small amount of mobility at the joints. Now the thorax, on the other hand, needs to be also most, both mobile and controlled. And thoracic rotation is probably one of the, the key movements that we need to be able to assess um, in the thorax because it's rotation between the thorax and the pelvis that allows us to convert the trunk into a spring which shock absorbs during impact loading tasks such as running. It gives us the, our power both for kicking and for throwing. So when we're looking at sports that involve uh, hitting a ball, swinging a club, throwing, anything or, or running or twisting, the relationship of the thorax and the ability of the thorax to rotate relative to the pelvis is, is huge. It's criti critical for function. The thorax also is the region of the body that adjusts for changes in our center of mass over base of support. So whenever you see a lateral translation of the pelvis in relationship to the foot or the head and neck in relationship to the foot, the area of the body that tends to compensate for that is, uh, is the thorax. And a lot of it's based on its anatomy. It is the direction of um, least resistance is in the, in the coronal plane and the lateral plane. And so it is the area that, that really tends to, adapt for that, to, tends to adapt for that. So if we come back to the pelvis now and we go more deeply into the pelvis, in 1998, um, Dr. Fleming and I sort of put together this model around the pelvis to help organize a number of the clinical tests and a lot of the research uh, around the pelvis to make it a bit easier to organize our knowledge for assessment. 
So there's four component parts um, of function that we have to look at when we are assessing the the pelvis. And the first is looking at the form closure mechanism. So this is an engineering term, form closure, which speaks to the integrity of the bones, the joints, and the ligaments, and how they contribute to the ability of the pelvis to transfer loads. So we're speaking of bony conditions such as fractures, such as infections, or conditions that relate directly to the bone. And the joint, of course, any inflammatory condition, any autoimmune condition uh, within the joint can have an impact on its control. But collectively, together with the very strong ligaments of the pelvis, the form closure mechanism speaks to what we used to call passive stability, or that the integrity of the passive system, Punjabi would call this more about the, the passive stability or the passive system, in terms of how um, the passive system con contributes to stability. But by itself, the passive system is cannot tolerate or manage all of the loads that we put through the pelvis. We need a force closure mechanism, or in other words, we need a contribution from the muscles and in part by their fascial extensions or their fascial relationships, if you like, between the muscles to add additional force or compression to the system in order to prevent shears, uh, between the anonymate and the sacrum, between the pubic symphysis when it's under load. Now, what tells the muscles when to work when comes under the umbrella of motor control. So this is the nervous system now telling the muscles and the fascia, and it goes two ways. So we get the sensory input from the muscles and the fascia as well, and also from the joints and the ligaments, telling the neural system what's going on. And then the neural system are under motor control telling the muscles when to do what. These are the three major components of the biomechanical model, if you like, pertaining to the pelvis that we have specific tests to address. Now, what can impact all of this, of course, is the fourth component, which is our emotional state. And this is where the psychosocial components um, with respect to pain and with respect to motor control can wreak havoc in terms of both mobility and control of the pelvis. So simply put, these are the four components or the four areas that we need to have tests to assess in order to say that we truly are approaching the pelvis in a biopsychosocial manner. Now, if we come back to now looking at motor control and altered motor control, remember altered motor control presents with a redistribution between muscles, but also within muscles. And it's not correlated to any consistent pain pattern. Just because you have this redistribution doesn't mean we can say where it's going to hurt. So this redistribution of activity can have a huge impact on the posture alignment and biomechanics of the thorax. So what we should see in a healthy thorax with rotation is a lovely, gentle, even concave curve towards the side that they're turning towards. Well, what do you think is going on when we see a thorax that moves like this, this picture on the right? I'm hoping you can see my arrow. So this individual has many, many segments, many what we call thoracic rings, which is one of these. A thoracic ring is two vertebral bodies and the, and the ribs that are related to it. It's derived from the embryological somite and all of the joints that connect. So we call this a thoracic ring. So it's clear that in this subject, the thoracic rings are not congruent. They are not rotating in the same directions. There are many, many uh, different levels within her thorax. Some are going to the left and some, some are going to the right. And some of this may in fact be related to stiff joints within the thoracic ring, namely zygopophyseal or the costotransverse joint. But it's also not uncommon to see patterns like this that are directly related to altered recruitment strategies in the neuromuscular system. So what happens, let's take one example here where we see one fascicle of the iliocostalis that's over, that is overactive. What, hap what is, could potentially happen in that situation? So let's go back to 1991 and let's take a look at a study that was done by uh, McIntosh and Bogduck. And it was an anatomical study that looked at the connections between the various fascicles of iliocostalis. And I would direct your attention to this area here, which is right around the posterior superior iliac spine. And take a look at where the fascicle arising from the seventh thoracic ring inserts. So in this area here, we have fascicles arriving from the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth thoracic rings. 
If we have overactivation of, say, one fascicle of iliocostalis, and it's very easy to feel, it feels like a pepperoni stick in the middle of a salami. You, you palpate the entire breadth of the iliocostalis, and you can just pick up one overactive fascicle. You can trace it up to the rib that it attaches to. You can trace it down. It tends to disappear down here into the thoracolumbar fascia. But knowing your anatomy, you know it attaches to this part of the iliac crest. It has the potential to do a number of things. And it depends, of course, on what's happening with your deep fibers of multifidus, the pelvic floor, transversus abdominis. It, it really depends on what the entire pattern is. But if we have overactivation of this fascicle, it can impact mobility of the sacroiliac joint and can also lead to, which can then overload other tissues. So this is what this looks like. So, this is a very common test for mobility of the sacroiliac joint done by many different disciplines where you palpate one anominate relative to the sacrum and you should see symmetric movement between sides. And you can clearly see on this individual that her left anominate is able to posteriorly rotate. Watch my whole hand, not just the thumb. The whole hand is rotating posteriorly relative to the sacrum. Whereas on the right side, there's just a lateral tilt of the whole pelvis. There's no intra-pelvic movement happening. Now, look at the lateral displacement of her thorax in relationship to, to her pelvis. When a thoracic ring rotates, it also translates to the opposite side. And that was a study in 1976 by Punjabi. So this contralateral translation um, is one of your first dead giveaways that you have got a thoracic ring which is which is rotated and we use the translation aspect of the biomechanics to actually pick up um, the the impaired ring so the point here being is that that muscle cannot eccentrically lengthen it will limit posterior rotation of that anomaly now it's not just iliocostalis that can do this you could have overactivation of a fascicle of the external oblique one fascicle of the external oblique can, can result in a very similar pattern. So I don't mean to be just blaming one muscle on this, I'm just using uh, one muscle as an example. Now, similarly, if we look at a weight-bearing test, this over if we have overactivation of the long back muscles, the evidence shows that we often have inhibition or underactivation of some of the muscles of the deep system. We can't predict which one it'll be, you have to assess, but it could be deep fibers of multifidus, it could be transversus abdominis. We don't know, you have to assess. But if you have inhibition of the deep system and overactivation of this superficial system, what it can do is it can cause a force vector or a vector of force, which um, results in loss of control of the sacroiliac joint. So the form closure mechanism of the sacroiliac joint, in other words, the bones, the joints, and the ligaments, are render more, um, stability or increase the compression of the sacroiliac joint, which then helps to resist shear when the anominate is posteriorly rotated relative to the sacrum or the sacrum is nutated relative to the anominate. Several studies in the, in the, in the 90s have supported that. So the closed pack position or the best position for loading the sacroiliac joint is one where the anominate is posteriorly rotated or the sacrum is nutated. Anterior rotation of the anonymate slackens off the major ligaments of the pelvis, sacrotuberus, sacrospinous, and the interosseous, puts some stress on the long dorsal ligament, which is why it often why it tends to become painful, but it ends up sort of creating a, a, a control problem at the SI joint, and it looks like this. So this is what should normally happen, so that anonymate is staying posteriorly rotated relative to the sacrum, but watch what happens here on the right. As she shifts her weight to the right, you can see it's hard for her to find the center, get her center of mass over her foot. But this anomaly is sites of impairment here. 
which one? Should we go after training the pelvis or should we go after this, this correction of the posture and alignment of her thorax in relationship to it? Well, you could guess, I suppose, and just try and see what happens. But clinically, we are much further ahead than that. We now have specific tests that can tell where we should go. And yes, we need to layer some evidence on, and that's starting next year in uh, University of Chichester. We'll be doing some studies on this. But what we needed is we needed, we needed machines that could actually measure some of these things before we could actually um, test the hypothesis. Now, longissimus will do a similar thing, but longissimus has more of an effect on the lumbar spine than it does on the, on the pelvis. Because if you look at the attachments of longissimus, and we come down to, again to the, the fascicle that's arriving from the seventh thoracic ring or from the eighth, overactivation of the, fasc the, the seventh and eighth fascicles of longissimus actually pulls the sacrum up into nutation. So it increases the form closure mechanism of the sacroiliac joint when longissimus is overactive. But look at the fourth fascicle. So the fourth fascicle or the fifth fascicle from longissimus attaches to L4 and L5. And I've chosen six in this slide, but you could actually look at any, any one of these ones in this area here. If you have overactivation of longissimus, and I have no idea what makes the brain choose longissimus over iliocostalis or vice versa. I can only tell you what I see clinically. What commonly happens with this is a loss of control at L4-5 when you add additional load through the arms. So here in picture labeled A, what I'm doing is I'm putting a, I'm pushing to the right, this fellow's pushing to the left. So he is I've got a resistance to left rotation through his trunk in sitting. And what I'm doing down here is feeling for control at the spinous process of L4. So in a static loading task, when I put resistance through his arms, if you have an ideal strategy, and I'm not saying which muscles have to work, but if your strategy is ideal, that L4 should stay still because the task doesn't involve movement. And for this fellow, as soon as I put a small load through his through his arms, what happens is that he loses control at L4 and his, his ability to to resist me is is quite low. And you can measure that with a microfet. We've done this in the past as well. Now, if I prevent or if I add some control to the at the level of that sixth thoracic ring and then resist it, now I need a third arm to test it, but I think you can see when you look at his lumbar spine, his low back is more controlled, um, L4 doesn't move, um, and you just have to take my word for it at this point, and his strength immediately increases. You let go of the uh, control of the thoracic ring, and you see a, a change in the alignment of his low back, and he immediately weakens. So again, this is just another example of um, a change in a recruitment pattern that of the low back that 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 links the thorax to to the to the low back and can be in relationship with it okay now we also see implications for continence and for pelvic organ support in that when you have overactivation of the superficial muscles whether it's your back or the abdominal walls it often uh, will lead to increases in the interabdominal pressure and this can have huge implications for function of the pelvic floor uh, pelvic organ support and can lead to incontinence, uh, pelvic organ prolapse and or pelvic pain, okay? So we can't just look at one area of the body um, in the presence of pain or incontinence or prolapse. We have to look at that relationships and we need a way to clinically reason the significance of the noted impairments, poor control, poor mobility, poor alignment, um, in each body region, and then to be able to prioritize or choose which impairment requires an intervention, because there's many impairments that are absolutely not interfering with um, how that person is living, living in, in their body. So we need a way to figure it out. So the integrated systems model is a regional interdependent model. It was a model that was co-developed with Linda Joy Lee in the um, Oh, 2010, 2011, um, and I have carried on since 2013 with the development of this model. And the focus of the approach is on finding the body region, which when you correct something, it might be alignment, might be mo mobility, restore mobility, it might be provide control. It 
the improvement in alignment biomechanics or control has the greatest impact on the biggest number of other sites of impairment, but that's not enough. It also has to improve the patient's performance and also their experience of their body. So the patient is integral in this approach. If it doesn't feel better, if they don't move better, then it doesn't matter. It has to make, it has to make a change. So we really are dealing with um, nociceptive symptoms here and not nociplastic, not neuropathic necessarily. Uh, we really look at, at looking at the bio in the biopsychosocial part of the model. So for example, if we look at somebody who has low back pain or pelvic girdle pain with sitting, the squat task would be a very useful task to evaluate because we don't get into a chair by standing on one leg. So the one legged standing task wouldn't be useful, even though it's a validated test for the pelvis. We would be looking at the squat. Show me how you sit in a chair. And if during this task, we found that they lost control of the sacroiliac joint, the anomalous rotated anteriorly relative to the sacrum. And if we also note that the hip fails to center, so the femoral head stays somewhat center, uh, forward rather, the hip stays forward of the, the anonymous, that would be another impairment. And if we also find that the thorax is lateral over the center of mass, which means there's a rota something rotated in the thorax, we now have three sites of impairment. So we don't know whether it's the hip driving the loss of pelvic control, whether it's the pelvis driving the loss of alignment of the hip, or whether it's the thorax driving the loss of pelvic control in addition to the um, malalignment and biomechanics of the hip. So we're, we can't start treating yet because that would be a guess. And what we try to do in the integrated systems model is to develop sound hypotheses using deductive reasoning to make our best, generate our best hypothesis for going forward. Does it always work? No. Are we always right? No, nothing is. But at least it's not a guess. So what we do is that we play them off one another. We would apply compression to the pelvis and then see what happened to the hip alignment. We'd correct the alignment of the hip across the greatest number of impairments in the body. That tells you the body region that you need to start treating. But the question is, what do we do with it? So now this is where once you've found what we call the driver or the area of the body that you've decided needs treatment first, now we need further assessment of that area. And this comes back to traditional physiotherapy 101. We need our active and passive mobility tests. We need active and passive control tests. And the interpretive reasoning of these four tests helps to determine the underlying system impairment, which are collectively contributing to this suboptimal motor control strategy for that individual, for that task. They may have a totally different and optimal strategy for a different task, which why it's important that we identify the meaningful task to the one that's problematic. So manual therapy is a key component for differentiating the various system impairments. So the system impairments would include articular, neural, myofascial, or visceral system impairments. So impairments in these systems can all have exactly the same impact with respect to alignment, biomechanics, or control, the treatment is very different. So an articular system impairment speaks to lack of mobility of the, the thorax, the zeal, or can pertain to excessive mobility. But excessive mobility may be about the form closure mechanism. There may have been a trauma that has resulted in damage to the disc or damage to the, to the ligaments that control the joint, or also could relate to uh, suboptimal recruitment strategies of the force closure mechanism. So altered motor control that leads to suboptimal recruitment of the rotatories or multifidus or the intercostals or the muscles that are responsible for control between two thoracic rings. So that the uh, excessive mobility may in fact be related to a form closure deficit or may be related to a motor control problem that is altering, altering the, the force closure for, for the joint. Now, we can also have uh, myofascial system impairments and myofascial system impairments speak to 
tightness or actual structural restrictions in muscles and or in, in the fascial system. So in the integrated systems model, the use of the word myofascia is a little different than in myofascial release techniques training. So myofascial release techniques are more about releasing or treating the nervous system to get a muscle to relax. When we use the word myofascia or a myofascial system impairment in the integrated systems model, we're talking about structural changes to a muscle. So um, loss of sarcomere length. Uh, to a tear in a muscle, to, to a tear in a tendon or a lesion in a tendon. Diastasis rectus abdominis is a myofascial system impairment. It's lengthening of the aponeuroses. Um, what else? Endopelvic fascial tears in terms of uh, um, uh, pubic coccygeus avulsion ruptures off the back of the, the pubic bone. These are all myofascial system impairments because they're structural. So in the thorax, the main myofascial things that we see are often related to muscles that uh, have been held in a position for such a long time that you get shortening of sarcomeres and they actually get uh, or a reduction of numbers of sarcomeres so the muscle gets short and so these are muscles that are actually tight or you can have scarring from from trauma from from surgery uh, from infection those sorts of things right Visceral system impairments, there are many, many things inside the thorax that attach to both the vertebra and to, and to the ribs. And the, the visceral system can have a huge, play a huge role in, in creating malalignment or suboptimal alignment of the thorax. So when you are actually correcting the alignment, so if you take a thoracic ring and you, you derotate it or you, you correct it, and then you do this thing we call release and listen. When you let it go and you listen, the, the, the location of the force vector, whether it's in the front or the back or the inside, also helps to direct you towards the, the, the identifying the underlying system impairment. Now, once you've identified which system or systems require treatment, manual therapy is also a key component for releasing or treating the restrictive articular neural, myofascial, or visceral system impairments. So without manual therapy techniques, I wouldn't know how to assess the thorax. I wouldn't know how to treat it. So here what we see on the left is a picture of me hanging on to a eight thoracic rings. So my hands are on the left and right eight thoracic ribs, and you can see they're not level. So we can't just uh, find one level and then run our hand directly across because when a thoracic ring is rotated, the ribs will be on a different level. So landmarking is really, really important. And when we do our active mobility tests, this is the handhold that we use to sort of determine whether the ribs are anteriorly or posteriorly rotating. But if the rib ring can't rotate either to the right or to the left, and you want to then identify, is the costal transverse joint a, a, a part of that pattern? We need our specific arthrokinematic tests, which you see here on the top. In this area of the thorax, which is called the vertebral sternal region, the joint shape is concave or convex. So we are looking for a craniocaudal glide of the, the rib relative to the transverse process. So in right rotation, the ribs should glide inferiorly relative to the transverse process. On the left side, it should glide superiorly. So we need to be able to feel specifically to know whether or not it is the costal transverse joint on the left or the right that's causing the problem. The joint plane in the lower part of the thorax and the vertebral chondral region, it's a planar joint. The direction of the glide is much different. Anterolateral inferior, posteromedial superior. The point of this slide being that without manual therapy and without manual therapy assessments, I wouldn't be able to identify whether or not I needed to treat the right side of the thoracic ring or the left side of the thoracic ring. Similarly, when it comes to treating articular system impairments, we, we need our manual therapy techniques to be precise and to be specific because if we don't direct our treatments to exactly this precise joint, then um, we're not going to get as good a result as we possibly could. Now, if it's a neural system impairment, there are many diff different things that can change the recruitment strategy, many, many different interventions. Dry needling works, myofascial release techniques works, um, so yoga works, Pilates can work. There's, there's so many different things that can work to help to um, reduce the overactive 
um, recruitment strategy to facilitate the, the underactive muscles. And I wouldn't say that there's any one approach that is better than another. It really depends what you're good at. So, um, and, and it's a good thing that we have more neural system impairments than, than other system impairments in this area. Otherwise, if we had to be precise with everything we did, uh, I think it would, be, it would be tough to get everybody better. So lots of different things can, can work to help to restore these muscles. But um, often, in my hands at least, uh, manual therapy is, one, is my go-to technique um, for, for restoring, uh, restoring mobility and function. So in summary, this is not all you need to know about thorax, obviously, but the point being is that we are resilient and dynamic, and we have an incredible potential to adapt to trauma, and we will continue to adapt to trauma until we no longer can. And once our ability to adapt to these multiple impairments is exhausted, our resilience is reduced, and often symptoms start to appear insidiously or start to appear with very little load. I didn't do anything. I just picked a pencil up off the floor and now I have all this back pain that won't go away. Well, that's not really the true story. The true story is when I was 14, I sprained my ankle. When I was 18, I, and so on and so on and so on. And the adaptability has just been exhausted. And the victim of all the impairments is now your back, your knee, your neck, your elbow, your whatever it is. So often it's the victim that cries out a lot and it's the criminals that stay quiet. So the symptoms can be inconsistent, they're highly variable, and as the evidence is showing us, they're often not in relationship to the specific impairments. And we're talking now about complex patients, persistent pain, multiple impairments. I'm not talking about the acute, the acute trauma, the acute sprain joint, okay? So in going forward, we have to hear the whole story. You want to you wanna hear everything. And yes, that patient that comes in with the one and a half inch file folder, it is important to let them tell their whole story because you will often find that the, that, that the number of impairments that they are trying to adapt to is huge. So take a look at all of it. Assess the whole body and the whole person in tasks that have meaning. Find a way to go head to toe and take note of the multiple impairments and then try to develop a way to understand the relationship between the impairments. In other words, how is one impacting the other? Look at the interdependence between the regions, call it whatever you want, but let's look at, at how they're relating to one another. So that in this manner, we can treat the body regions that are causing the problems versus though that those that are in compensation for others. And in this manner, the, the danger signals, the threatening signals from the body that are truly coming from altered alignment, biomechanics, and control, and being mediated or informed through the nervous system telling the body, I don't like this, I want you to do something different. In my experience, a lot of them will get better. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea of looking at the thorax in relationship to the pelvis, drawing on some of the evidence from the motor control world, as well as um, looking at regional inter interdependence models, and we will encourage you to be less specialized and more uh, looking at the whole body and the whole person going forward. Hello. Thank you very much, Diane, for that very informative talk. I'd like to now remind the listeners that if you do have any questions, to please type it into the taskbar and I will forward those questions on to Diane. So Diane, thank you very much. It seems like you've highlighted the, the very, very important and multidimensional nature of, of physiotherapy and the importance of clinical reasoning, the importance of assessing, treating and reassessing and using this multidimensional model. Some of the questions uh, kind of line up here, so I'll start with the first one. And the first one relates to, you've highlighted um, several different things, including form closure versus force closure versus motor control versus the effect of the emotions. And the question is, if all of the above are present, which do we address first? So this is where your manual therapy is, is going, your manual therapy tools are going to help you. 
So let's say that we have found that the thorax is the, is the driver, is the place that when you um, correct something in, in the thorax, uh, you get pelvic control back. So I need an example that's a little bit bigger than that to be able to answer the question. So I'm gonna lay on the assumption very much like the, the video clip we saw. We have somebody who has pelvic girdle pain, poor control in her pelvis, poor alignment in her thorax. Um, when I come up onto the thorax, the first question is, can I correct the alignment? If I can't get that thorax, if I start to correct it, and I can't get the thorax alignment to change, then I am immediately going to go into either the articular or the, the myofascial system. So if I'm going into the articular system, I'm looking at the form closure mechanism because I'm looking to assess the, the joints. If I can correct the, um, the thoracic ring, if I can get the alignment to improve a little bit, so you just create a little bit of space, so you traction the ring a little bit, and then you just try to unwind it. It's a good way to start. You just try to derotate, derotate the ring. And if I can do that, then I, am not, I don't have an articular system impairment because I can move the joints. So then you let it go and you feel for where's the pull coming from? So if when I let the thoracic, thoracic ring go, if the first thing that happens is that the, and I've got, let's say I've got a translation to the left. So the, the ring is rotated to the right, translated to the left. I correct it. And then as I let it go, I feel what happens at the ribs. If I feel the right rib posteriorly rotate first, and then the whole thing translates, I'm looking at a vector on the back pulling the rib into posterior rotation. So then I would go and assess all of the muscles that attach to the, the rib in the back. So I look at iliopistalis, I look at the lats, I look at and I go palpate to determine what do I need to do. So we call it listening and the listening kind of comes from the Baral Institute. We kind of took the term from the, the Baral world. We, we listen to the system as we release the correction to determine the location. Is it on the front? So if the left rib had got pulled into anterior rotation first, then I would be looking at everything that attaches to the rib in the front and has the potential to pull the rib into anterior rotation. So your manual therapy skills in the, neuro, in the neural system, so basically looking at overactive muscles, then tells you um, which, system, which system that you're going to be going into. So I can't tell you exactly where I would start until I have the information as to what does it feel like when I correct it. Can I correct it? Rules out my joints. Rules out all my manual therapy tests for the joints. If I can't correct it, rules out all the myofascial release, all the neural stuff, everything else. I go straight into arthrokinematic analysis of the joints. So that's a very simple um, explanation of how I decide which manual therapy tool I pull out on my toolbox for further assessment. Depends on what the findings are with the correction. Okay, the, the next question kind of builds on sort of the treatments and it's it's basically asking you to comment if you think that visceral mobilizations then uh, play a part in uh, the practice of manual therapy in the thorax. Absolutely, absolutely. But do, do we have to have the uh, precision of what is taught in the visceral courses to be able to treat a visceral impairment in the thorax. Not always. So we often will use breathing, um, and I don't mean we in the integrated systems model, but just we in physiotherapy. We use the breath as an adjunct or a tool to help to release things that we have no idea what we're releasing. So often what you feel when there is a, a visceral vector, that, let's say that the person's had a, a lung inflection, infection or pleurisy, and the parietal pleura at that one point is kind of sticky on the inside of the rib. It can have the potential to limit or create more of a restriction or pathway of resistance, if you like, for that ring. What you feel when you correct and release that ring is at the very end, so you release the ring, it rotates, tends to translate a little bit, you will feel an inside pull. There'll be a pull of the rib to the inside. That, always, that almost always suggests to me that there's a visceral contribution. Now, I may not be able to name it as well as, say, someone like Jean-Pierre Barral or Gail Wessler. Uh, it depends on the level of courses you've taken. But... I can treat it because I can hold the ring aligned and then I can use the breath 
either a diaphragmatic breath, a lateral costal breath, a breath directly into my hand. And what I'm looking for is a breathing pattern that pulls on the rib the most. So you use the breath as an assistant or a tool to identify the other end of the vector. So this is a technique that was developed by Linda Joy Lee called ring stack and breathe. So ring stack, meaning correct the alignment of the thoracic ring, and then use the breath to help to get it to release. We can use muscle energy techniques, hold, relax, uh, in combination with breath. We can use a combination of positioning of the thorax into extension, rotation, side bending, and then essentially find the position of the thorax and the rib that seems the most resistant and then use the breath in, in that position to release the visceral vectors. Now, I may, when I chart that, I may not be able to say that it is the pericardium, it is the lung, it is, I may not know what it is. Um, I may, but I may not. And so I usually just chart that as a, there's a thoracic visceral vector, treat with a general technique like ring, ring, ring stack and breathe. So I think the visceral world and, and is starting to, um, lay some evidence, do some research on, on some of their techniques, very difficult to, you think manual therapy techniques for the articular system are hard to investigate. Boy, really tough to investigate the, the visceral world, but they're, but they're starting. And I think we're going to see over the next 50, 75 years, huge validation for some of the work, uh, a lot of the work that's been done by Jean-Pierre Burrell. Another question related to treatment, Diane, and it's kind of building on, on sort of what you're sort of uh, indicating with uh, with the look, listen, and feel, it's related to the use of ultrasound. Um, and maybe you can comment on whether this is a tool that could be used, for example, to uh, see what one of the muscles, like transverse abdominis, will do with your eyes and fingers to see if it correlates with what you're seeing on the use of imaging, such as ultrasound. Is that something Absolutely. that you use? Absolutely. Absolutely. And... Uh... And we've done this, we've done this, and we're going to test it next year at the University of Chichester. So the nerve supply to the abdominal wall comes from the thorax. So from, from T7 down to L2 is where we find the nerve supply. So if you have something going on in those segments, um, you can get altered neural drive. So years and years ago, we used to call that a facilitated segment. If you remember from way back in the Irvin and Core days in the 1940s, it's been recognized for a long time that we can get changes in, in, in neural output when there's some impairments. And peripherally, we can see changes in the peripheral muscles as well. So if you work with ultrasound and you, let's go to the middle layer of transversus. So the middle layer of transversus is above the iliac crest, but below the rib cage. So between the 10th rib and the highest point of the iliac crest. It's where most of the research on transversus abdominis has been done. And let's say you ask the person to recruit their pelvic floor and you see nothing happen in, uh, in TA. You don't see any response, nothing. The internal oblique sl literally slides over the top of transversus, there's no response. Then what I would suggest you do is go up into the thorax between the sixth and the 10th thoracic ring and see if you can find something in that area that appears to be rotated. And be very general with it and just take that part of the thorax and correct it, just derotate it. Like on our courses, we get very ring specific, but for the webinar, just, just play. Just get the thorax, take the twist out of the thorax. Now, you have to then do the little Wilson maneuver where you get them to lift their bum and put it back down again so the pelvis can reset or change in relationship to that correction, right? So you don't want to still leave them twisted. Basically, take the twist out between the thorax and the pelvis, put the probe back on, and see what happens. There is a subgroup of people that when you correct that take the twist out or derotate the thorax on the pelvis, it changes the recruitment strategy of the deep system. There's another subgroup of people where it doesn't. So in the subgroup of people where taking the twist out improves your recruitment strategy, then these are the people who do really well with release, align, and move them. Let's just, let's release and align them, and then let's just get them moving. Let's get them moving according to the meaningful task. Back to yoga, back to Pilates, back to general training. The person who won't do well with that is the person who, when you take the twist out of the system, transversus doesn't come back on. Well, tifidus doesn't wake up. These are the subgroup of people, in my opinion, that really need the, the wake-up training, what we call stage one wake-up training, the specific, the specific recruitment training for those muscles. And then once you wake those up, then you start to integrate them and start to get them to move. 
Absolutely. Use your ultrasound. You'll see it in the pelvic floor. You'll see it. You'll see pelvic floor uh, relax. You'll see it come on. You'll see the abdominals change. And I don't use ultrasound too much with multifidus. I use because my hands are more sensitive than, than um, the ultrasound machine is with multifidus. Um, but you can. You can see it. And I bet it works for the rotator cuff and for all sorts of other areas that some of you may be using ultrasound for that I'm not very skilled at. But for the abdominal wall, for sure. I'll ask one more question here, Diane, just before we close the session, and it's related to, is there a quick way of knowing if you should uh, treat or needle an overactive muscle like iliocostalis, for example, um, when you're unsure if it's a compensation or the the source of the thoracic dysfunction causing the pelvic girdle pain, for example? Great question. Oh my gosh, you guys, your questions are amazing. Um, Yes. So again, it comes down to this feeling or listening when you release the correction. So when you have a muscle that's overactive, you will get an equal and opposite response in some other muscle, right? So let's take the example where the overactive muscle is external oblique, really common with back pain, really common with incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. So, and it will cause the, 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 rib to be pulled into anterior rotation, which has a whole consequence on the entire ring. Well, let's say that you're looking at this person from the back and you see, and they're complaining of back pain because of the compensatory overactivation of iliocostalis. If the thoracic ring is rotated to the right, there's no way that overactive iliocostalis is causing that. It's reacting to it because the muscle is actually lengthened and working hard as a break to stop the ring from rotating to the right further. So you can use your understanding of the biomechanics of how thoracic rings work to not release a reactor and go treat the muscle that's causing it, which in this instance would be the external oblique, or you can correct, release, and listen and feel for which rib moves first. Because in the scenario I gave you, it would be the left rib getting pulled into anterior rotation, right? So using both your understanding of biomechanics and what it's possible for that muscle to do as well and combining that, so triangulating your finding, have two tests that get you to the same finding and this is the way that we can actually be more reliable and valid with our manual skills is to have two ways to get to the same conclusion. Um, you you, You won't make a mistake, right? And even if you do make a mistake and you dry needle a reactor, if you go back and positionally test that ring, you'll know because the alignment either won't improve or you'll, you'll have made it temporarily worse. It will come back once the muscle wakes up as a, as, as a break again. So you won't, you won't hurt the person, but you just won't benefit them as much as if you go after the muscle that's causing the problem versus the one that's reacting. Thanks for that question. Great question. Well, We've run out of time now, so I'd like to thank you, Diane, for taking time out of your busy schedule and for providing your expertise and all of the work that you've done over the years on not only this area, but also integrating this into the pelvis and uh, different considerations for the physiotherapist to think from assessment and or treatment and that integrated model. I'd like to remind our listeners that today's session has been recorded and iFont is currently working on developing a video library that should become available in early 2020 for those that are interested. We will also be providing certificates of attendance for those individuals that have attended. If there's any feedback that you'd like to provide, please provide it via email at admin at ifont.org. A reminder that our Future webinars will also occur in November and December, and more details will follow in the future. I'd like to thank Diane for her presentation today. I'd like to thank the MOs and registered interest group members that have supported and have attended today. Tell your colleagues about Diane's next presentation, which is on September 17th, 2019, if this this was missed. So once again, on behalf of IFOMT and all of the attendees, I'd like to thank you, Diane. Oh, thank you very much for this opportunity to share. Thank you.